Welcome to the Fleece and Harmony Knitting Podcast. It's Kim in Belfast, Prince Edward Island in our woolen mill and yarn shop. I'm here by myself again this week. Jen's still away. So we're going to see uh, how this goes this time. So we've got kind of a packed agenda today. There's um, been some updates on the farm. We have uh, whips, luckily no rips. It's just, uh, I'm gonna update on my projects that I've been knitting. And uh, we're gonna try to do a row and review this time since we missed the row and review last time. And then we have a shop update, of course. And we've even managed to put together a harmony part. Um, but right before the harmony part, after we finish the shop update, we're going to take a little tour of inside the mill. So last time we toured the shop, and this time we'll show you uh, where all the magic happens for the yarn, with the yarn being made. And we've got it set up out there so that we can go um, through the whole, the whole process. So the machines won't be running because they're very loud and we wouldn't really be able to describe anything. But we, uh, we will show the, the whole process right from the start to start to finish. We have it set up in there to do that. So without further ado, the good news on the farm is that the sheep are on grass. So that's always a great time because it means that um, they're, they can sustain themselves on our pastures. We have about, uh, I don't know, it's like about 66 acres of pasture. So there's lots of pasture for them and they just love it when the grass is, uh, when they get out on grass. And that means that we're not hauling hay every morning like we normally do and just takes them a while to figure out where they're going and because we move them every second or third day because we want to them to eat the grass down but we don't want them to destroy the grass so that it, it um, grows back fairly quickly so we can rotate them through through the different fields and this is dandelion season here so we have lots of dandelions and I'm not sure if um, no mo may is everywhere, but here it's a big, it's a big deal. So you're not supposed to mow your fields or your yards in May because the dandelions and the early flowers that come out like dan weeds, we call them weeds, but they're the flowers, as far as the bee is concerned, they're flowers. So that's their first food of the, the season. So we are um, not supposed to mow, mow our um, yard or pastures or anything, and we haven't. Um, you'll see a picture, <laughs> so it's just plain, plain yellow. And the only thing, I mean, there's a battle, always there's a battle to keep your lawns weed free, or it used to be more popular to do that than it is now, I guess. But now people are, are just loving things going wild. However, our neighbor, still likes to have a weed free lawn but i think she's fighting maybe a losing battle because all around her there's nothing but fields of dandelions right now and she's she's just reseeding her grass and i'm actually every, every time i look at it i feel guilty because i know what's going to happen in a week or two all of the the dandelions are going to be gone and there's going to be nothing but puff balls of dandelion seeds flying everywhere and i'm not sure what she's going to do <laughs> what she's going to do after that However, the good news for the sheep is that they love dandelions. So they just go through the, the grass with the dandelions and they just love it. And it's so cute because they're chomping away and the flowers are, are um, sticking out of their mouths and everything is really, really cute. And they're very, very happy to have all of those dandelions. So that's uh, that's the uh, the update, and um, we'll, now it's kind of smooth sailing for the rest of the summer because the pastures will grow, and they'll keep up to the amount that the sheep are eating. So we're not going to have to to move hay around. Uh, the good news was, or the good news is that we made it through the uh, the winter without having to buy extra extra feed because we had the right amount of haylage. That's always um always a big concern that we're going to run out when it's still kind of cold and and so forth but this year we have we have a little bit of extra so we've got some for a rainy day if if we need to uh, feed more and the sheep are, are out on grass and then they'll just move through all the fields on the on the farm for the rest of the summer and we can probably feed them out there well into october uh, as long as it's not too dry this summer if the grass recovers we've got enough land that they can rotate through and by the time they get back to the first place where they started 
the grass should be high enough for them to uh, to eat um, again, so that they so we don't need to to worry. That's that's the hope anyway. So that's the farm update. Um, I didn't really say much about the weather. It's actually been really nice the last couple of days. Um, we are starting to get a little bit of warmth in the the air. So I'm still wearing a sweater and I'm still, you know, have a light jacket on all the time because it's a really windy right now. But other than that, it seems like spring maybe has, has arrived. Yay, finally. So, but we have a thing called January here, and that may still throw us a curveball, but we'll see how what, what happens. So I guess we'll get right to the knitting because I've made some progress on the Paisley sweat cardigan and the Madeline sweater. So we'll start with the Paisley because I actually had quite a lot to talk about Paisley this time. Whoop, my ball of here. I just put two new balls in here. So the last time I was here. I had was just um, I hadn't started the I'm just going to try to get these in my lap so I hadn't started I was just still doing around um, doing the arms and I hadn't started the sorry I'm <laughs> this is all tangled up okay here we go I was still working on the arms everything was still uh, in the round now I have started the decreases for the neck in the front and we're not in the round anymore. So once you get to where you bind off for the first, the, the first neck edge in the front, then you have to start working flat. And I'm not going to lie, I'm not a big fan of doing color work flat back and forth with all over pattern, patterning. I'm having to pay real attention to this. Uh, it's not that it's difficult, it's just that you need to be really careful and when you're purling the color work and you've got these motifs that are not just repetitive patterns, you need to really check um, as you go. So when I'm, and the inside of the sweater because of the all over color work, I'm just going to show that, hopefully you can see, is there's, there's floats everywhere because it's, it's uh, all over color work. So it's really hard to see the stitch, the stitches that you're knitting on the front uh, with all the floats because it kind of obscures the pattern a little bit. Whereas when you're on the front, you can see how your pattern is developing. So it gives you a little bit of hint of where you are. When you're purling, you don't have that benefit. So I'm being really careful to make sure that I check every row after I finish it to that there's not a mistake. Luckily, the pattern is so well defined that if there was an error somewhere, it would pop out really easily. And the decreases happening along the neck edge are eating away at the pattern piece with the paisley. And what you're almost left with, not quite, but almost left with is going to be just the checkerboard. And in that case, purl is, is no more difficult than, than knitting and following the pattern for that because it's so repetitive. And uh, just as a three, uh, uh, three stitch pattern. So this is uh, so this is really coming along, um, and I have uh, six more rows, and then I do the the binding off for the back neck, and then basically that part that part is done. So I'm just gonna hold it up so you can see the whole the whole thing, and you can see now how these. For most of some of you, I suppose this arm pole sticking thing is nothing new and not very impressive. But for me, I'm finding it very, <laughs> very impressive because I haven't done it before. So there's the uh, so there's the paisley and the back. So uh, that's making making good progress on that. The next project that I have is my Madeline, and I have finished the back and the front now. So that's off the needles. So the, um, the front, as we talked about the last time, I made a scoop neck in the front instead of the boat max neck. So the pattern um, is a straight across neck, which is not good for, for me. I have a short neck, as I said before, and I don't really like it coming right up uh, across the front of my neck. So I decided to alter the pattern and uh, make a crew neck. It did get a little bit lower than what I expected, but I'm okay with that. If it's even if it's down just at my collarbone, I'm perfectly fine. And just again, I should uh, say this is Madeline, and the designer is Galena Carroll. 
So that's done. And I had, uh, I still have to do the duplicate stitch. I had, didn't work anymore on the duplicate stitch. The back um, is, is uh, also finished. Well, I, actually, I think that was the back and this is the front. This is scoopier. <laughs> and I have a little bit of um, duplicate stitch done there, same as what I had before, but I do kind of work on that off and on when I don't feel like doing the knitting anymore. So the next part, of course, is the sleeve. And I have my two sleeves. Sorry, I'm just going to put down my... Now I have four four balls of kids okays that I'm working with because I'm doing two at a time. Um, so it just looks like a mess. There's not really anything much for me to show you except that it's just coming coming along the sleeves. And these sleeves are three quarter length sleeves when it's done. So th these will go uh, fairly quickly. And there's a lot of um, if you hear a rattling in the background, it's actually it's so, it's so windy here today that the uh, <laughs> we're in the shop. There's a, the door behind me is a pocket door and it kind of shakes in, in the, uh, the frame a little bit when it's super windy. So that's what you're hearing. Not somebody knocking. And so this is uh, so this is the Madeline sleeves after I've got about 10 more rows of the pattern. And once I finish that, it's just just a straight shot up. And like I said, they're three quarter length sleeves, so they're not even full full length. That should be uh, that should go fairly fairly quickly. So that's all progressing nicely. So I still didn't I still didn't cast on Ken Spark. He hasn't been complaining yet. So hopefully, hopefully he's being patient. Uh, but I'm fairly anxious to do it. I said that in the last episode as well. And I don't know what happened this week. All of a sudden, everybody is knitting sweaters out of soft yak DK. And now I want to start. I want to start that one. But I don't dare start it until I get a little bit even further with my other two projects. Because then I might just rest back on my laurels and knit that. Because I think it's going to be quite an easy, an easy knit. I should mention the last, the last time we recorded and I was showing the little vamps the little socks that uh, Janet that works here with us knit um I had said that I forgot to bring them over but actually Ken was wearing them he had to take them off <laughs> while I was looking at them so if you notice that I was like looking to the side it was because he was trying to take his socks off because he was wearing them and hand them to me without it being on film so, or on uh, the the in the recording so that was a little bit uh, a little bit of a, a snafu but anyway minor I guess so that's uh, so that's the the whips works in progress there's no finished objects obviously we're still we're still just knitting on uh, the same things that we were knitting that's one of the problems with garment knitting is that you're always they're big projects so it takes a while to to get them done. Um, I have decided that I'm going to do a row and review this week. So we are going to talk about Island Blend Fine. This yarn is a relatively new yarn to us and we did feature it in a previous episode when we first got the, uh, the yarns in. But I want to do a little bit of a deep dive. It's a very, very interesting yarn from Rowan and I wanted to talk a little bit more about it. So there's only 11 colors, so it's not a, it's not a really like one of their most, it's not like, like Kid Silk Haze or Felt a Tweed where you've got 40 odd shades. Um, I think I pulled them all out. I don't, I might be missing one or two. I'm just going to show the selection. So they have a lot of kind of muted uh, colors, but they also have a few pops of uh, brighter shades. So this is it. And they're going to be go all over the place. So this is the, the selection. I'm just going to put the, them down and I'm going to hold up uh, one or two. So the, the composition of this yarn is 70% wool, 15% alpaca, and 15% silk. And it's so soft and beautiful that it's really hard. It's very, very uh, smooth and uh, nice, soft yarn. The, it's a two ply, so the, you have a, a two ply yarn, so it's fair, it's fine, it is fine. There's 180 yards uh, on a 50 in a 50 gram skein, so that's uh, that's the, uh, the the length and the the weight. The interesting thing about it is that Rowan has sourced the wool from the Falkland Islands, and it's merino that's used in this baby alpaca. 
And the marina from the Falkland Islands is well known to be very fine and lovely. So that this is where the wool, and it's organically uh, grown. So it's an organic merino from the Falkland Islands that makes up this um, that makes up this yarn, and it's it's really lovely, as I said. So this um, there's a few patterns. It's a relatively new. They had out pat or island uh, blend as a thicker yarn for for quite some time, and there's actually a feature on it right now. Uh, there's a cow with uh, Martin I made along with Martin story on the island blend not the fine one, the regular one. And then they launched the, uh, the fine later. And there's a couple patterns that I'll show you pictures of because it's, they're actually absolutely beautiful. There's this lovely Celtic uh, poncho called Hinchinbrook, which is just gorgeous with the border of the, those uh, Celtic uh, cables that you can see. And there's also a pretty easy sweater called the Shutter Sweater. And it's, uh, it's marked in the scale that Rowan uses for the, um, the difficulty of the patterns as easy. So if you want something to do that's just a simple classic sweater, the Shutter Sweater is a good example of uh, what you can knit with uh, the Island Blend Fine. So that's uh, that's the, another yarn down for the the Rowan uh, Rowan review. So then that brings us to the shop update. We have um, a couple things that I want to talk about in the shop. Some of it is brand new, and some of it's not new. I just we just did a little bit of a refresh. So the first thing that I'm going to show is I didn't have a Swift built in the last episode. And I had mentioned that we just got more inventory from Scott from Fox Mountain Spindles. So I'm going to show what the Swift and Yarn Buddy looks like when it's when it's built. So I just put this together and I just put a sample skein. This is just a little sample skein that we have and um, to show you how it works. So it's absolutely smooth as silk the mechanism in this swift so when you're using uh balling your yarns it's it's just beautiful this is all handmade obviously um scott has just a wonderful talent for making the wood just sing it's it's really beautiful there's a couple little features so when you, when you purchase this these two arms of the of the swift come come apart there's a little um screw in the middle which it has a hole for an Allen key. And Scott has ingeniously put the Allen key right on the side of the arm with a little magnet. So you never have to, you won't lose it. It just sticks right there. And you use the Allen key to uh, remove the arms and then you can make the base into a yarn buddy. So you have the Swift when you need it and then you have the yarn buddy. And I'm gonna show you that right away because it's really, really easy to do. Um, you just have to take your, you wouldn't have a skein on it, obviously, when you do this. So we'll just remove this. These pegs all come out, so you get the pegs separately. And there is one of the pegs that has a screw on the bottom, and so that's movable, so you can adjust, uh, you can just adjust for the size of your, your skein. I'm just going to set that down because this does screw off, it comes off. You won't be able to see this, I don't think, but just comes apart. So you have a little washer and you have this, this screw that goes underneath and that, um, that makes your, your peg adjustable. Let's put this together so I don't lose the washer. And when you want to take it apart, you just use your Allen key and the screw just comes out just holding if you can see this okay these arms come out like this and this and um, i'm just gonna put the screw in the allen key there and then there's a, also a little washer that's that's on top there you just keep that on and then you screw in this larger peg just like that and then you have your yarn your yarn buddy that you can put your ball of yarn on top and and uh, pull 
while you're knitting. So it's as easy as that. There is a little cap that goes on to hold your yarn all in place, just like this. And all of that comes together when you buy the, the Swift Yarn Buddy combo. So I did want to show that because um, I said that we had them in stock, but I, I didn't have a chance to put one together and show you how, how easy it is. So that's fairly easy. The other thing is that we carry a lot of jewel designs, shawl pins and buttons, and she also makes um, removable closures. So when you have a cardigan or a sweater that you want to um, put something that's you want a, clo a closure for it, there's all kinds of things that we have in jewel designs to do that. And we got a few new pieces in. So we have all the shawl pins and the shawl sticks that we normally have. I mentioned the last time that we got the charm lock shawl pins back in stock as well but we do have a couple new pieces that we haven't had before so these are in kind of crinkly packaging so i'm going to try not to move it too much but one of the uh really amazing things that laura does from jewel designs is she makes these um that she's designed these penannular brooches I've demonstrated those on podcasts in the past. So there it's like, looks like a shawl pin, but the stick is attached and uh, you use it that way. Runa is a Celtic knot um, design and it is one of our most popular designs that we have. I hope there's not a glare on that when I'm showing it. It comes in a white brass color, but now it's been introduced in a black um, brass so she's calling it uh she's calling it black but it's really more like um kind of an aged an aged color so i'll there'll be a picture on the website if you're interested in that so you have the white one and now you have the the darker one for uh you have your choice it's the same design in, in runa and annular also we uh we had floral pedestal buttons that we showed a couple weeks ago and those are still in stock but Laura also makes these leather ones. They come, we have them in black and the color truffle, which is like a deep, deep brown. And these can be used like buttons. They're le leather pedestal buttons is what they're called on the website. You can use them like buttons and it's the same mechanism as um, Jewel uses for all of their, their items. So I'm just gonna take these, this one out of the package. So you have um, two pieces of leather and you have make a little leather button like that and the way that it works is there's a screw closure on the back and there'll be pictures of, of this so you can see it up close you just unscrew the screw you put the post of the screw through your garment and then you um, just tighten the two pieces together and you have a temporary closure that can be removed um, and these little tiny ones they're they're 0.9 of, of an inch the they're good as well for if you have big shawls and pieces that you're not sure of how to wear them uh, jewel also ha she has a, a really good resources on her website to show the different ways you can use some of some of the items that she makes but this is really cool because you can use these little tiny buttons if you have a big shawl and it keeps falling off or you don't you know not sure how to fashion it on or style it you can actually put one of these little buttons under each arm and fast, fasten the two sides of the shawl together and then it makes kind of like a like a poncho so that you have armholes so that you don't have to be fiddling around with your shawl and having it slide uh, slide off and so forth so we have these in the shop they come in two sizes and two colors so there's black leather and there's brown leather the brown one is called truffle and there is the um, just under an inch size and we have an inch and a half size as well, which is uh, which is bigger. You can see that. So that's uh, those are new new things to the to the shop. We also have a new book in the shop. We've been waiting for this for quite a while. We did do an Instagram post on this, and uh, a story it was featured in our newsletter last week. And it's uh, knit like a Norwegian. So this has uh, six different famous Norwegian designers uh, that have designed in this book, in this book, and they are, um, there's 30 patterns in it. Uh, of course, Arne and Carlos is there, and uh, Ber Berger Burr 
I hope I pronounced that right, is also in the book, and Linda Marvin and a couple of other people. Again, it's just an excellent uh, book. There's uh, there's a wedding dress in here. <laughs> there's um, a long uh, a long dress as well. I tried to look on the the internet to see if I could find pictures of the pattern or of the garments in it to make a slideshow, but I wasn't able to find anything. Just lovely, lovely uh, sweaters. Hopefully, you can see a little bit. And um, there's just there's 30, 30 patterns, all different. Uh, this is a nice one. Well, there's they're all nice, so I'm just flipping through. Won't do too much of uh, the all over cut as well. So that book is in stock. And I mentioned that I put it in the newsletter last week. So I just want to explain a little bit about how our newsletter works as well. We send out a newsletter every Friday afternoon. And what we're doing is that anybody that subscribes to the newsletter in the, the newsletter, we're featuring our products first. So the people that are subscribed to the newsletter, when you get the newsletter, we've got something new in there, you're the first to see it. And you have a, a little bit of a jump. After the next week, the alternate week, we send out the newsletter letting you know that we've launched another podcast. And we, we hopefully still have some of the things left that we featured in the, the letter the, the week before, but then they're available for everything, everybody. So when we show something on the podcast, then that's available for everybody that, that's uh, aware of the links. We always put the links in the podcast uh, show notes, but there are certain things that people that subscribe to the newsletter, we, they'll have access to it the, the week before the podcast launches. So um, also in the shop update, we've um, brought back a yarn that we were making about three years ago. It's a little bit difficult to make because you need the right fleece to spin it and it's called flock fingering. It's a three ply, 380 yards and 114 grams. So it's the same weight as our sock yarn, but it's 100% wool and uh, it doesn't have any mohair in it. So we did a batch of that for the newsletter last week. Um, literally one of the colors sold out in four minutes so <laughs> you, had, you had to be quick but that's a good example of where we would feature something on that week that there's not a podcast for the people that are subscribers to the newsletter so that they have a first shot i'm making more of it so i don't have anything to show you because it all sold but i have pictures we did three colors that we hadn't done before in flock fingering. One is thistle. So thistle is one of the regular colors that we have in our catalog. And then we um, did a, a color called thistle blossom that is based on the amethyst brooch color, but the depth of shade of the, the hue is lighter than amethyst brooch. So we've called that thistle blossom. And the other color that we put together with uh, thistle and the thistle blossom is linden blossom. So linden blossom is a light, very light chartreuse green that we carry. And it's named after linden trees because the linden trees in the early spring have these beautiful blossoms that just smell fantastic. And they're that almost that exact color of that yarn. Our linden tree is just about to, to bloom. That's also early food for, for bees. Uh, in some places, they actually call it the bee tree because there's it's just they're a huge tree and it's just covered with blossoms and the bees are just there all the time. You can actually hear them buzzing in the morning when the sun comes up outside our window because the tree is is right in front of our window anyway I, I digress so we have three flock fingering it's a it's a smallish batch that I'm making but it will be available uh, for people that are that are hearing this and uh, just to again to mention that if you do subscribe to the newsletter then you'll you would have seen that a week a week earlier and this book was uh, featured in the newsletter last week as well and I must make a point that the newsletter, if you have an account in on the Fleets and Harmony website and you've checked that you don't want marketing, email marketing, then the, you don't get the newsletter. So if you want, if you already have an account and you want to receive the newsletter, then you need to make sure that um, you are allowing email marketing. So it's the only thing we send is just the newsletter. So we're not going to inundate you every day with uh, with another newsletter. We do it once a week. 
and uh, but you, if you don't it's a lot of people are uh, have asked us why they didn't get the newsletter to have an account but if you've selected that you don't want email marketing then that's why you didn't get it so you can uh, you can go in and just uh, check that make sure that you have access if you're not getting the newsletter and you want it okay so um, the other thing that I wanted to talk about is we did get a couple new things in Chiagu as well. So we carry Chiagu needles for those that don't know. And um, the, what we, we, we got uh, a while ago, we got the nine inch circulars in the stainless steel. So we, we have those. So for knitting socks and uh, mittens, they're, they're perfect. So you can, uh, you have nine inch stainless steel. We also have the nine inch in bamboo, which we've had for a long time. We've shown these, showed these before. So nine inch in, in wood, in bamboo, I should say, or metal. And we now have the 12 inch uh, circulars as well in steel, stainless steel, and they have a bend. In, I don't know if you can see that. I'm going to hold it up, but the the needle has a little bit of a bend in it, so you have a little bit more room on the needle itself. But it's uh, easy for ease of use. It's got a little bit of a, a bend, so it makes a, a circle, quite a small circle. That's the 12 inch, so good for sleeves, sweater sleeves, and so forth. And just as a reminder, we do in bamboo, we also have the 12 inch and we have 16 inch in bamboo for knitting hats and so forth. So, um, so that's that. So I think that's it for the shop update. And um, I'm just gonna check my notes. Nope, and that's everything. So now what we're gonna do is we're gonna pause. We're gonna get set up to do a tour of the mill and we're gonna do that. And after the tour of the mill, um, I won't be back. Uh, we'll say goodbye at the tour of the mill, but we do have the harmony, the harmony part uh, to come at the very end. If you if you like watching those uh, those segments, we have we have one this uh, this week. So we, I'm going to say goodbye for a minute, and then I'll see you back in the mill in just a few minutes. Bye. And we're back. <laughs> so we're gonna start the tour of the mill. And we, like I said, we kind of set up things here so you can see exactly how the process works without having to put the machines on. There's fluorescent lighting in here. So if the lighting is a bit uh, off, then that's, that's why. And we have lots of windows in here as well. So for working, it's great because we have lots of, we can look out over our fields and things like that when we're, when we're working. So this is where the process starts. We, uh, we use our own wool in our yarns and we also buy wool from other farmers on Prince Edward Island and this is how they come. So these are actually big um, totes, we call them totes, and they usually contain uh, feed, feed, but a lot of the farmers put their wool after they're shorn in these big totes. So this is how we buy them from, from the, the farm. Um, so big, bags like this and this is what it looks like inside so this is our skirting table and when you're skirting the fleece for those that don't know that's when you're cleaning the fleece all of the the big things like there's little timothy heads and so forth so we take those part those parts out uh, we shake out if there's as much vegetation as we can but the the fleece is is really not not clean you'll just remember what this looks like looked like when we get around to the few processes and you're going to see what happens it's very greasy it has lanolin in it and uh, we what we need to do is we need to wash it in order to clean the lanolin off and the good news is with sheep's fleece that once you take the lanolin off a lot of the dirt comes off at the same time because it's stuck to the lanolin and this is a particularly nice uh, fleece you can see that we like it around this length so it's about uh, three three inches long or so this is perfect for what we uh, what we want to do uh, with this so we clean up as much as we can of the big vegetation and everything here and then we put it in a tote and we go to the washing machine so that's this way So here's the, the fleece after the, the biggest parts of the vegetation have been, been taken out. Uh, it already looks better and uh, it, it's all separated. So the locks are kind of broken up a little bit because it can be a little bit clumpy when it's been sitting in the totes. So that's all broken up. 
then we put it in uh, the wash. The washing machine has three compartments, so it's divided into three. I don't know if you can see inside there. There's a little bit of divides into three, and it has a very, very slow agitation, and the water that goes in there is really hot. It's about 150 degrees or so. Uh, maybe it gets up to about 160 actually I think and uh, you need it about that, that hot to be able to melt the lanolin which is what you really want to do and uh, it really goes very slowly and then um, it, it's spun out so that it's uh, that it, most of the water is gone uh, after that the lanolin just gets washed out we get a lot of questions about people saying do we recover the lanolin and we don't have a process to do that and so we, we can't and usually it's pretty dirty what comes uh, what comes out of there and what's in the filter and it's not <laughs> it's I don't know what you would uh, we how we would have to refine it and we can't do that so we don't use the lanolin after uh, the wash it comes back over to the skirting table and it's laid out on the skirting table and sorted it again so if there's any little vegetation and stuff that's still in it then it's, it's sorted again and it's put here on these drying racks. So here you can see what it looks like after the, after the wash. There's still stuff in it, but we get rid of that. But it looks, uh, I'll just compare to the, um, the raw fleece that I had here. So if you compare, you can see, you can start to see the difference of what's happened just with the, the washing. So it dries here it takes about um well a good six or seven hours to dry these racks are all um like a grid so the air circulates through through the rack so it dries fairly quickly but it still takes about six six hours or so to to dry after it's dry it comes over to this machine that's on the back here called the picker and the way this works these guards are are all here there's there's drums inside here that start the combing of the of fleece and opening up the locks and um, i'm just going to put this down so you can see what it looks like when it's uh so you have the guard there so your hands can't get close to the uh, and the fan comes on automatically so it's, <laughs> i'm going to put that back up again and uh, so what happens is you can see those pretty small amounts on this belt that are moving through into those drums and it's really like the uh, the maw there's uh, needles on the drums that are quite rough uh, that are do kind of an opening like I said of the of the locks and there's a huge fan here because what happens is that when it goes through that machine the fan blows it into this room and we had a special it's a little special room that's built that holds all the fleece and it all just blows onto the floor there's nothing in there now but it comes out a, a hole there and just blows like uh somebody busted a big pillow in there i'm just going to move it out of the way so you can see and you have to be sure that you've got the door closed when you start the the picker because it blows all over the place if not so it's just a fluff so after it's picked the next stage is to do we do some fiber separating or it's called a fiber separator um so you don't have to do this this stage after that but we do it because we're getting farm wool and it does still have a lot of vegetation in it so we want to make sure that it gets super clean this is a little bit of a cheat because this has gone through the fiber separator twice so you can see how um how beautiful and clean that is so it goes through the fiber separator once that takes out mostly anything else that's there and then we put it through the second time just to um, to make sure that it's as clean as possible and every now and then this has gone through once and it'll go through again so you still have a few little spots of stuff that will come out and then believe it or not I know that some of you uh, have knit with our yarn and you know that you still end up with some vegetation there but this is how it looks uh, there after it comes out i won't bother to go to the back of the machine there's just a big bin that collects all of this this fluff after it goes through the next step is the carter so by the time 
it comes over here this is what it looks like it's been through the fiber separator twice we load it onto this belt and the carter is where it really starts to um, be worked the fiber starts to be worked i'm going to actually open up this um this door so you can see there's all of these drums that are in here i think there's seven seven different drums in the main drum and then there's also other little pickers and things that go through we've taken the guard uh off of this so that you can see see what it looks like it's quite a quite an impressive machine and all of this is just to keep co to comb the fleece and to start to organize the fibers. Uh, we spin a semi-worsted wool, wool yarn, so it's not um, it's not like a worsted yarn where all the fibers are perfectly parallel. They're still a little bit mixed up, like a like a um, a woolen spun, but it's somewhere it's somewhere in between. So I'm just gonna put this back up. Okay. And what comes out is that uh, you just get a shot of, again, what goes in. And then what comes out the other end Okay, so after all of the combing, all through the process, you get the roving at the end so or a sliver sometimes people call them slivers and this is what it this is what it looks like so you can see that it's pretty starting to be combed but it still has a little bit of uh, fluff and loft to it that's why our yarn tends to be lofty and this these this streams out and goes into these cans you can also make bats on here so if you remove this part this part just slides out from the machine um, there's a big drum on the bottom and you can make a bat of uh, fiber on that, but we're mostly using the roving, obviously. Once it comes out of the carter and it's in these big cans, we move these big cans to the, um, the back of the draw frame. So this is just another part of the combing process. You have um, two cans coming together, so I use two rowings to come together and blend, and that's just to blend if there's any inconsistencies in the rowing that we use or that we made. This all of this blending helps to make it even more consistent for the yarn. It goes over another um, roller in here and is stretched out. So the drafting process actually starts here because when the rowing is in this area it is being um, this uh, roller is going slightly slower than the roller in front so it's actually starting to stretch out the the roving it comes out and it goes into another can and uh, we put our yarns through the draw frame twice so it goes into a big can first and then we stretch it out again and we use smaller size cans to go behind the spinner so this is uh, so that next after that's in the small cans, we go to the spinner. So I'm just going to go over here, and I have a 12 bobbin spinner and I have an 8 bobbin spinner. This is the 12 bobbin. This is actually the flock fingering that we talked about in the podcast. So this is being uh, spun. So all of the cans are at the back. And then we feed the roving up to the front and then this, these are the bobbins and then this spins very, uh, very quickly. If you want to see the machines in action in some of the previous episodes, back at the very beginning, we showed the process with all the machines, uh, the machines running. Um, but like I said, it's, it's really quite noisy, so we, we're not going to do that today. But this is it. So they all, so all of these will run, um, run at once. This uh, flock fingering is pretty fine. So you can see that the plies are, uh, it's coming from something quite wide, like this, and being twisted down to something that fine. So when it comes off the bobbin, the next step is plying the yarn. So I just set up two, uh, two bobbins just to show you how it works. 
So it's, these bobbins would normally be full when it comes over here and you put two or three or four bobbins together, you feed it down through this little system here and then you're spinning onto another bobbin. This, to do the, the plying, you spin in the opposite direction, sorry, you ply in the opposite direction is, is what you spun. So those, those of you that are know a little bit about spinning, we spin on a Z twist and we ply on an S twist. So different mills do different things, but this is, uh, this is the way we do it. And this just is an example of a two, a two ply like our worsted. But uh, like I said, you can put three plies or you can do four together and uh, make as many plies as you want uh, together. Once the bobbin is full, then you've got yarn on the bobbin. The next step is to put it on a cone. So that's over here. And this machine, uh, the bobbin goes on the bottom. I don't have one uh, here because I finished this uh, batch. And you, it just winds, uh, winds the, uh, from the bobbin onto a cone. And then that's basically your finished, your finished yarn. If you wanted to have something on cones, it's there, it's, it's done. We do um, just, we don't use it that often because we're dyeing almost all the yarn that we make. If we make a yarn natural, like we did with the black, natural black that we have, we have to steam it to set the twist. And the steamer is there. It's, um, there's a water tank under there. And the uh, yarn is fed through these hole, through this hole. It's shot with um, compressed air to come shoot out this, uh, this steaming chamber and it's steamed in this chamber and these two machines are set at a distance so that the yarn dries by the time it gets to the cone. So we only do that for natural yarns that are not going to be dyed. Because we're dyeing most of the yarns we skip the steaming part and we because they're going to soak anyway before we do the dyeing. After the cones are, are full we put the cone on the skein winder down here and then this just turns uh, this just turns and puts on the on that makes a big giant loop which is you'll recognize as a, as a skein of yarn untwisted and then for us that's the finished part of the uh, of the wool processing the next thing to do is to dye it so we tie um, the little ties on here we get off, we take the skein off. We hang them here while we're working. So you can just see we've got a couple different um, types of yarn here. The ties are tied loose at this point because in the dye vat you want the yarn to be able to move around. So we're going to go all the way back to the beginning and we're at the dye vat. So this is basically just a big soup pot. <laughs> It's just a just a tank basically and we have hoses there and we fill it with hot water we heat the water and this is where we do all our dyeing and as big as this is we can usually dye about 12 or 13 skeins depending on the weight of the yarn in one batch so when we say that we have small batches and we have to do if, if you order eight or nine skeins then we do a batch usually especially for that so that we have enough skeins that are all coming from the same uh, the same um, dye lot so we then um, after the the skeins are dyed we give them a little bit of a spin back in the washer and then we hang them to dry and you might have noticed there's yarn hanging around in the shop we just it's really low temp we just put it on hangers with the with the ties and we let it uh, dry in the, in the windows mostly. And then after they're dry, then we twist the skeins and they're all set. And then this is where we prepare our orders for shipping. But just all the boxes are here. We have a little table that we, uh, that we work on. And um, we have orders when we're waiting for yarn to be made for certain orders we just we pack it, as much of the order as we have and then we have things uh, the orders that they're with their packing slips and uh, we pack it up and that's the end of the process then your yarn is out the door so we thought that you might like to see how that all that all works 
and um, it's quite a long process from start to finish by the time you we start skirting to the time that we're back here to pack the order it can be up to two days to do that whole process you have to wait for yarn to dry you have to wait for the wool to dry so it is quite quite a long uh, a long process but we have yarn in progress the whole time in different stages so um so you know we've we kind of figured out how to make it as efficient as possible these days so hope that you enjoyed uh, that little tour um do stay tuned because the harmony moment is coming up and um, enjoy that and we'll see you the next time.